As in ancient Babylonia, ancient Egyptian culture developed rich mythologies reflecting its history and day-to-day -day concerns. But the world we find in Egyptian mythology is very different from the Babylonian world. Babylonians told stories of a violent, primordial past that had produced a well-ordered present. In contrast, Egyptian mythology tends to emphasize perpetual violence and destruction. It describes an endless struggle to maintain order in the face of chaos. Let's begin with one of the most well-known Egyptian creation stories, which originated in the city of Heliopolis, located in the Nile Delta region. According to this myth, the god Atum, who was identified with Ra and sometimes referred to as Atum Ra, arose as the divine creator. He first created Shu, the god of wind and air, and Shu's consort, the goddess Tefnut, the goddess of moisture. This couple in turn created Geb, the god of the earth, and Nut, the goddess of the heavens. Geb and Nut created Osiris and his consort Isis, as well as the god Set and his consort Nephthys. These nine gods, Atum and the four male-female divine pairs, together are known as the Aeneid. The Aeneid created the heavens and the earth, including the stars and other heavenly bodies. In a different creation myth tradition, the creator god in the form of Ra chose to create all living things. Now, some accounts suggest that he looked into space and whatever he envisioned in his mind came into being. Humanity was created from his eyes, and Ra made himself the first human king on earth. He took on human form and ruled over mankind. Trouble arose from a couple of sources, though. First, the goddess Isis, who lived among humanity as a woman, decided that she wanted to live among the gods and that she wanted power equal to Ra's power. Using magical power, she created a poisonous serpent. The serpent bit Ra, who began to feel excruciating pain. He cried out for help, and Isis spoke up. She said that she could heal Ra, but only if he told her his secret name, the name embedded in his heart, the name that gave Ra all his power. Fearing death, Ra agreed to let Isis learn his secret name. Further, he agreed to let that secret name leave his heart and enter into Isis's heart instead. At that moment, Ra disappeared from the realm of the gods, and Isis received his secret name along with all the power that went with it. A different myth tradition is found in a book known as the Celestial Cow. Versions of this book were found in several pharaohs' tombs, including the tomb of Tutankhamun. According to this tradition, as Ra aged, human beings no longer paid him the respect that he felt he was due. Ra decided to punish human beings by sending his Eye of Ra, his vengeful persona, in the form of the goddess Hathor to destroy them. Hathor was a complicated figure, taking on many roles throughout Egyptian mythology, including at times Ra's wife and his daughter. She is often associated with motherhood and fertility, and she's sometimes known as the cow goddess. Manifesting Ra's anger in the world, Hathor took the form of a lion and was referred to by a different name, that of the war goddess Sekhmet. In this form, Hathor began to kill the Earth's entire population. However, once Ra saw the devastation that she had caused, including filling the Earth with human blood, he regretted his decision. The problem was that once Hathor had started to taste human blood, she couldn't be stopped. Finally, Ra stopped Hathor's slaughter by tricking her. He got her drunk, and a small remnant of humanity was saved. Ra then decided to leave the Earth, but the remnant of humans followed him, begging him for forgiveness. They slaughtered his enemies in order to make up for their rebellious ways. Ra accepted that slaughter as an atoning sacrifice, but he also declared, from this time forward, I will dwell in heaven. I will no longer live upon the earth. After this declaration, Ra left the earth, ruling from the heavens, mostly in the form of the sun. These myths and other creation mythology centering on Ra 
emerged during the 19th and the 20th dynasties in Egypt, roughly the 13th through the 11th centuries BCE. This is about the same time as the Israelites were settling in Canaan and establishing what would eventually be known as Israel and Judah. This mythology tells us a number of things about Egyptian life from that time period. First, there were several strong cities in Egypt and distinct religious and myth traditions associated with each. For example, Ra is a key figure in Heliopolis, but not so much in Hermopolis and Memphis. The differences in the various gods' popularity reflect the strength of the independent city's identities. For example, a different creation myth comes out of the wealthy cosmopolitan city of Hermopolis during the Old Kingdom period, between 2649 and 2150 BCE. And by the way, you'll find some variations in the dating of the periods and the kingdoms in ancient Egyptian history, but the dates I'll be using are fairly widely accepted. In the Hermopolis version of the creation, circulating during the Old Kingdom period, the universe begins with four pairs of male and female deities. These four male-female pairs are known collectively as the Ogdoid. The female deities were associated with snakes and the male deities with frogs. They represent hiddenness, darkness, formlessness, and a watery abyss. Together they represent a time of primordial chaos. In the Hermopolis myth, the gods are out of balance with one another. Their imbalance leads to the creation of a kind of primordial egg. And out of this egg emerges Ra, the sun. After Ra is created, he rests for an extended period. Then he works with the other deities to create the rest of the world and to establish order. There are several versions of the section of the Hermopolis creation myth that describes Ra's emergence from the primordial egg. In one version, Ra emerges from an egg that has been laid by a celestial bird. In another, the creation continues almost in kaleidoscopic fashion, beginning with a lotus flower that emerges on the primordial waters instead of an egg. When the lotus petals open, they reveal a beetle which is a manifestation of the god Ra. The beetle then takes the form of a weeping boy, Nefertum, and Nefertum's tears become all the creatures of the earth. Thus the creation of all living beings on the earth is contained in a lotus, which literally unfolds and a series of forms appear, lotus, beetle, weeping boy, and tears, ultimately producing all living creatures. In addition to reflecting distinct major city identities, Egyptian mythology reflects Egypt's political history, and it will be helpful to delve into that history briefly to place the myths in their proper context. As you can imagine, ancient Egyptian history is complicated, but for our purposes we can break it down into a few broad periods. The prehistoric or pre-dynastic period lasted from about 6000 BCE until about 3100 BCE. During this period, Upper and Lower Egypt were constantly in conflict with one another. The terms Upper and Lower Egypt are a little counterintuitive. If you look at a map of ancient Egyptian civilization, you'll see that it develops along the winding ribbon of the Nile River. Now it's tempting to assume that the Nile River flows southward from the Mediterranean Sea south to the Nubian Desert. However, just the opposite is true. The Nile originates in the south and flows northward, emptying into the Mediterranean. Roughly around Cairo, the Nile Delta forms, spreading out like a fan. The designations of Lower and Upper Egypt reflect the fact that the south is at a higher elevation than the north, which explains why the river flows as it does. So Upper Egypt actually refers to the south of Egypt, the region including Aswan and Thebes, modern-day Luxor. Lower Egypt is in the north, and it refers to the region including Memphis, Heliopolis, and the port cities. Thebes was the capital of Upper Egypt, and Memphis was the capital of Lower Egypt. Some scholars have argued that Egyptian myths, such as the Heliopolis creation myth, 
originated in the pre-dynastic period, reflecting the ongoing political and military struggles for control of Upper and Lower Egypt. Stories concerning conflicts between gods are found in multiple sources throughout Egyptian history, and they're not restricted to one city, such as Heliopolis. For example, several texts, including Egyptian funerary texts, the Great Hymn to Osiris, and the Memphite Theology, all refer to an intense conflict between the male gods Osiris and Set. These brothers battle to take control of the world. Set ultimately triumphs, killing Osiris. In addition, scholars argue that some of these myths are tied to pre-dynastic rituals. For example, some say that the creation story's reference to Hathor becoming drunk with alcohol is the basis for an ancient Egyptian New Year ritual, in which priestesses would offer large vessels of alcohol to the goddess Hathor. Around 3100 BCE, the two kingdoms of Egypt, Upper and Lower Egypt, were united under King Menes, the first true pharaoh of Egypt. The unification of Upper and Lower Egypt ushered in a new phase in Egyptian history, the dynastic phase. We know quite a bit about King Menes' reign. He concentrated his administration in Memphis, and he built a new worship center known as the Temple of Ta, one of the supreme triad of gods in Memphis. Now note that in Memphis mythology, Ra wasn't the creator deity, Ta was. Ta was presented as a master builder, architect, and creator, and he was the patron of artisans and craftsmen. The Egyptian Book of the Dead refers to him as a master architect and framer of everything in the universe. We know that by the beginning of the dynastic period, the Egyptians had a well-developed philosophy about life after death. They preserved the bodies of the dead, and they buried their dead with food and drink and other provisions for life after death. Much of the mythology from the dynastic period comes to us from artifacts created to accompany individuals in their journey after death. For example, most of what we know from the Old Kingdom period, approximately 2649 to 2150 BCE, we know from images surrounding the dead in temples and tombs. The creation story from Hermopolis, the one about Ra emerging from the egg or the lotus flower, comes from this time period. The fact that ancient Egypt circulated multiple creation stories isn't actually all that unusual. Many cultures produce several different creation stories. What's interesting is why cultures like ancient Egypt generated multiple stories. Many cultures believe that no single creation story can encompass all the elements of the creation of the universe. And we'll find this in later lectures in this course as well. After all, it's a big job to build a universe. Instead, these cultures produce multiple stories, each intended to highlight different aspects of creation. The idea that one creation story can encompass all aspects of the creation of the universe is actually pretty rare. In addition, scholars have noticed that different local communities tend to develop slightly different creation stories. Specifically, most scholars note that later Egyptian creation stories link their creation stories to a previous story, and then they have their supreme deity trump the previous supreme deity. Why would they do that? Well, we think that this was a strategy used by cities with large worship centers, such as Heliopolis, Hermopolis, and Memphis, to assert their superiority. Each city developed a creation story with their preferred deity as the supreme deity. One easy way to do this in a creation myth was simply to replace one god's name with another god's name. For example, Ra became Atum in the Heliopolis creation myth. Another example is much more recent. One creation story originating in Memphis dates to around 700 BCE. This story doesn't refer to Ra at all. Instead, it focuses on Ta Nun, an androgynous figure. Ta Nun links the eight gods of the Hermopolis mythology with the nine gods of the Heliopolis mythology. Ta Nun ultimately speaks the name of Atum, the creator god, 
and then the rest of the world comes into being. In a variant of this myth, the god is simply known as Ta, and he's described as a kind of cosmic craftsman god who fashions the universe. In all of these instances, local gods are given central importance, either displacing earlier gods altogether or subordinating them in some way. Again, this isn't an unusual strategy. It occurs in other creation stories all around the world. Another explanation for the multiple creation stories is a bit different. Some scholars argue that as time passes, different worldviews emerge, and these different views are reflected in different myths. Remember that we're talking about thousands of years here. Again, the pre-dynastic period in Egypt began around 6000 BCE, and Cleopatra, the last pharaoh of ancient Egypt, died in 30 BCE. This means that the myths we're reviewing here span 6,000 years. One famous late Egyptian text originating in Memphis, known as the Shabaka text, or the Memphite theology, is dated to about 710 BCE. It presents Ta as the creator god, and it's fairly abstract. Ta imagines the entire creation, and then the text says that he brings it into being by his own word. The creation process here sounds very philosophical in comparison with the earlier Heliopolis and Hermopolis versions. In the Memphite version, the god's name, Ta, means creator. He's portrayed as a mummy, holding a scepter containing the symbols for life, power, and stability. He's also often shown standing on a hieroglyph associated with Mot, the goddess of order and truth and balance, and we'll talk more about him shortly. In this late Egyptian mythology, the world emerges as a realization of a thought in the mind of the creator god. This is a far cry from eggs, lotus flowers, and beetles. Egyptian mythology is also important to our broader discussion about myth because of its interesting view of time. Modern Western conceptions of time tend to be linear. We think of time as moving in one direction, from a beginning point to an end. Cultures influenced by the Abrahamic religions tend to conceive of time in teleological terms. That is, we generally think the world is improving and moving towards some culminating final purpose as we move forward in time. There's a sense of progress associated with the march of time. Ancient Egyptian notions of time were different. The ancient Egyptians divided world history into two distinct periods, the ancient or primordial past and the present. The present time involves a series of repeating cycles, probably reflecting the annual agricultural and climate cycles. However, the Egyptians believed that in the primordial ancient past, time was linear. Mythic events such as creation occurred in ancient linear time. Mythic events were determinative. They established the patterns that are repeated in the present age. Thus, the creation myths do not just refer back to events in the past. They occur in a qualitatively different time in the history of the world. Stories set in this primordial time period have implications for the world in which we live today. Whereas the past age involved new, one-of-a-kind events, the present age is cyclical and repetitive. Events that occur in the present age are not original. They echo mythic events. As the present age repeats these mythic events, however, they renew Mott an abstract notion representing the primordial order and balance of the universe. In particular, present events repeat the moment of creation, however that's described, and they reestablish the order of creation. Now, the concept of Mott deserves some attention here. The word Mott encompasses the concepts of balance, order, truth, justice, and morality. When it appears in the creation stories, it refers to the foundational ordering of the world, including its social and moral order. As we've seen, according to Egyptian creation mythology, in the beginning there was chaos. 
But this isn't just chaos in terms of the material stuff of the universe. In the primordial period, there was social and moral chaos as well. Most of the stories of the gods' activities are set in this primordial time, and their primary task is to organize that chaos into the ordered world in which human beings now live. At a certain point in Egyptian history, the principal Maat became personified as a female goddess. We find images of Maat as a goddess in the middle of the Old Kingdom period, around 2500 to 2400 BCE. And as we've seen, she remained a figure of significance as late as 710 BCE in Memphis. In her mythology, the goddess Maat regulates the stars and the seasons, and in some cases human and divine behavior, in order to maintain order and balance. She is coupled with Thoth, the god charged with maintaining the entire universe. Maat was often displayed with a scepter, the Ankh symbol, sometimes known as a symbol of life, and with an ostrich feather on her head. The Ankh symbol looks like a cross, except that there's a slender oval at the top, where the top vertical bar is located on a cross. Maat's scepter linked her with the pharaoh, as did the Ankh symbol. The ostrich feather was the feather of truth, associated with her role in the underworld. According to the ancient Egyptian myths, the feather was used to measure the weight of the heart of a deceased person, where the soul of the dead resided. If the heart was heavier than the feather, this meant that the person had lived an evil life, and the devourer goddess, Amit, who was known to lurk around the scales, would eat the heart. But if the heart was lighter than or equal to Mott's feather in weight, this meant that the deceased person had led a good life. And this determined whether or not a soul would reach paradise in the afterlife. Together, Thoth and the goddess Mott were responsible for equilibrium and balance. Once Ra superseded Thoth as the primary deity in Egyptian mythology, Mott was often depicted, along with Thoth, standing on either side of Ra's boat. And this positioning indicated her prominence in the Egyptian pantheon. One other point regarding Mott. It is closely related to the pharaoh, to his role on earth and his role in the community. Ancient Egyptian myth presents the pharaoh as an incarnation of God, or at the very least as the God's representative on earth. As a result, the pharaoh is charged with the responsibility for maintaining order in this age. Mott continually threatens to break down, and so human beings, under the direction of the pharaoh and the priests, are constantly working to keep disorder and chaos at bay. You'll notice that, is that, you'll notice that as in Mesopotamian mythology, the creation of human beings is not really a big deal in Egyptian creation stories. In one Heliopolis creation myth, humans are explained as the result of the tears of Ra. This is a different myth from the Hermopolis myth involving a weeping boy. And since Ra sheds those tears in a moment of weakness, human beings are perceived as weak and flawed. In this view, we're really nothing but a byproduct of creation. In another myth, once human beings are created, Ra rules for a period of time over both humans and the gods. Initially, there is a kind of idyllic period for humans, although Ra is constantly dealing with fights between the gods. At one point, some gods challenge Ra's authority, so he destroys the rebellious faction with help from Thoth and Horus the Elder, one of the earliest forms of the god Horus. Horus is another key figure in Egyptian mythology, and we'll explore his role in some detail in the next lecture. In a distinct myth called the myth of the distant goddess, the vengeful aspect of Ra, the eye of Ra, becomes upset with Ra himself and runs away. Now this is not Hathor, the goddess we mentioned earlier, but another form of the eye. The eye in the form of a goddess runs away to the dangerous realm beyond the Egyptian borders. Her absence means that the Nile River waters don't rise as usual and the land is threatened with drought. Ra sends out other gods to bring her back, and upon her return, the floodwaters rise and fertility is restored to 
the land. Eventually, as Ra grows older, humanity rebels against him. In the Celestial Cow story, after Ra prevents Hathor from destroying all of humanity, Ra begins to recede from the worldly realm. Ra recedes from human affairs and chooses to live in the sky, traveling from the eastern horizon to the western horizon each day, and resting in the realm of the dead at night. The remnant of humanity that is left behind after Hathor's rampage divides against itself, and a new age begins, in which human beings wage war against one another. From this time forward, we move into the present age. In this period, the gods recede, and human beings are involved in a constant struggle to avoid falling completely into chaos. In the Egyptian mythological traditions, this is roughly when the shift from linear to cyclical time begins. In some mythologies, this shift occurs as soon as Ra moves away from Earth and into the skies. In other mythologies, there's a time during which divine rulers govern for thousands of years, but eventually the change occurs and the world moves into a qualitatively new existence. It can be easy to become overwhelmed with all of these different versions of the Egyptian creation story. Different cities produced different creation stories, and often each city produced multiple versions of their core myths. However, when you step back, certain key themes appear over and over again. First, Egyptian creation mythology always involves the creation of form out of formlessness and order out of chaos. Second, the Egyptian gods are always ultimately responsible for creation of this orderliness, and they are the ones who sustain it. And finally, the created world is never completely safe from the threat of chaos. Not surprisingly, the Egyptian creation stories consistently place Egypt at the center of the created universe, and Egypt is the site for most of the gods' activities. Now, as a side note, this is almost always true in creation stories around the world. No culture places itself on the sidelines within its own creation mythology. We always feature ourselves as the stars of our own stories. Well, in Egyptian mythology in general, the Earth is a flat piece of land. Upper Egypt, also known as the Nile Valley, and Lower Egypt, also known as the Delta, are located at the center of the entire world. They're surrounded by infertile and dangerous desert land, and beyond that is chaos. Two mountains mark the east and the west horizons. The entire world then centers on the land of Egypt. Another constant critical theme is the importance of this geographic environment. The harsh desert land and the powerful Nile River conspire to create an unpredictable, threatening environment. And we see echoes of this threat throughout Egyptian creation mythology. At the same time, we know that the ancient Egyptians developed very sophisticated agricultural techniques. Scholars have argued that the development of agricultural tools and techniques and the ability to store food for times of scarcity transformed the ancient world and made civilization as we know it possible. Egyptians lived with this technological advancement but they still felt very much at the mercy of the environment around them. They knew that the fertility of the land, and therefore their own survival, was very fragile. Droughts could easily lead to famine, and excessive flooding could destroy both crops and buildings. In addition, the surrounding desert posed a constant threat, and all of this fear and tension permeates the ancient Egyptian creation myths. The Nile River was another important feature of Egyptian myth, and it figured into Egyptian ritual as well. We know, for example, that one ancient New Year celebration coincided with the annual flooding of the Nile River. The Nile River was at the heart of agricultural survival. The Egyptians came to know and depend on the annual cycle of the Nile, how it receded during certain times of the year and then flooded at other times. When the Nile flooded, it replenished the surrounding soil, making the land fertile for agriculture. The annual cycle of the Nile directly influenced human activity, prompting cycles of planting and harvesting 
that continued from year to year and informed a cyclical view of present time. The daily and yearly natural cycles brought a certain kind of order to lived human experience. Now, the Egyptians felt that it was ultimately up to the gods to control these cycles, but humans could perform religious rituals to appeal to the gods to maintain this order. On a larger scale, Egyptian mythology as a whole continues to explore the key themes that we find in the creation stories. The myths continue to speculate about cosmic and human origins. They continue to ask how to find order and balance in the midst of chaos. And they look to the gods for guidance about how humans can carve order and safety out of a threatening landscape. As time passed, the ancient Egyptians began to look at death and the afterlife in more detail as well. And they developed rich stories about the gods who ruled the underworld. The most developed texts about death and life after death begin to appear in the Old Kingdom period between 2649 and 2150 BCE, during the third through the sixth dynasties of the pharaohs. And in this period, the pyramid texts appear. The pyramid texts are magical spells inscribed on the interior walls of the royal pyramids. Literally hundreds of spells guide the deceased king toward the realm of the gods after his death. Slightly later, the coffin texts appear, writing inscribed in the tombs of royal court officials. Several centuries later, at the beginning of the New Kingdom period, beginning around 1550 BCE, we begin to find funerary texts aimed at people outside the royal court. Texts like the famous Egyptian Book of the Dead begin to circulate with illustrations. Other texts, such as the Book of Gates and the Book of Caverns, describe how a deceased person will journey to the underworld. These New Kingdom texts pick up on old themes found even in the pre-dynastic literature. They build on the creation story's descriptions of the gods, the nature of this world, and the nature of human life. In the lectures to come, we'll look at a wealth of stories, but they continually return us to the fundamental concerns laid out in the Egyptian creation myths. How to find order, balance, mot in a chaotic world.